anthropologists tend to think of culture as one of the hallmarks of human life, and most cultural anthropologists would argue that culture is a uniquely human attribute. Now, whether or not we agree with that statement depends on how we define culture, of course. And if you use a quite simple definition, such as culture equals between group variation in behavior that it is attributable, at least in part, to social learning processes, then the answer is no, it's clearly not uniquely human. We see traditions in all kinds of taxa, even perhaps insects. But if you start embellishing that definition and you add features such as Don Brown talked about, uh, like a complex symbolic uh, content or co uh, complex cumulative culture or a linkage between specific cultural traits and uh, group identity, then it may be the case that humans are unique. But regardless of your definition of culture, what evolutionary anthropologists are trying to do is illuminate the, the roots of culture, evolutionary roots, and in that case, it's necessary to take a much broader taxonomic sweep and see what kinds of traditions are present in non-humans. So in this talk, I'll define a tradition as a behavior pattern that's shared by its practitioners due to some form of social learning, and social learning as individual use of public information to organize behavior. The comparative method is our main methodological tool for figuring out the phylogenetic history of traits and the types of selection pressures that promote the evolution of culture or whatever other trait we're interested in. So you can easier use the comparative method to talk about homologies or analogies. So when we want to figure out what our ancestors are like, we look at what traits are present in humans and the most closely related animals, the great apes, and assume that those traits shared were probably ancestral. But this cannot tell us why we have these traits. To answer the why questions, we have to think in terms of analogies. And so what we do is we look for many other species throughout the animal kingdom that share the traits we're interested in and compare them with other species out there that don't have those traits. Try to come up with what are the, the common adaptive problems faced by the animals with the traits that we're interested in. So what might some of those factors be? Many biologists would argue that large brain size and, in particular, imitative capacities are important. Now, not everyone would agree with that, and for example, Galef would, would probably not. Everyone pretty much agrees that gregariousness and social tolerance are important because, obviously, the more models you have, the more opportunities you have to, to learn new innovations. And social tolerance is important because if you don't have a good relationship with this individual you're trying to learn from, you can't really focus on the task. Now, depending on what else you're interested in, there may be other factors. For example, for dietary traditions, you might expect those to be more common in omnivores because they have such dietary flexibility, unlike, for example, pandas that focus mainly on one food type. So there's more room for social cues to be important. For two-youth traditions, it's arguably the extractive foragers that will have the most need to develop tools, and they have very complex tasks they need to learn, so uh, arguably social cues could be helpful in that. And I'm going to talk mainly today about social conventions. So I will be arguing that very, animals with very complex social relationships, and particularly those that rely to a great extent on coalitions and other forms of uh, cooperation, not just aggressive, may have a greater need to communicate about their social relationships and test their bonds. So they may need traditions to do that. Now, capuchins meet all of these conditions. For those of you who are not familiar with capuchins, these animals live in multi-female, multi-male groups of up to 39 individuals. They're highly social, high, highly gregarious. They're very tolerant of close-range observation when they're foraging, and that's fairly unusual. They're extractive foragers, so most of their foods are uh, plants that require a lot of processing and also insects that must be extracted from woody matrices. And perhaps most important for this talk, they form coalitions all day long for all kinds of reasons, some trivial and some quite important. And the most important context in which they form coalitions is when males are migrating or trying to take over a group. We frequently see coalitionary lethal aggression. So animals like this unfortunate male who's just disemboweled by a male-male coalition, they, um, they absolutely need allies that they can count on when they're migrating, when they're defending a group, trying to take over a group, defend their offspring from infanticidal intruders. 
so um, most of the traditions research that is done with primates focuses on technology, on foraging strategies. And so what I want to do today is focus more on the social conventions, which I think are really the, the most important aspect of human culture. If you talk to someone, a layperson, and ask them what they mean by culture shock, they're not going to talk so much about their technology. Likewise, if you talk to a cultural anthropologist and ask what's the difference between two cultures, they'll start out by talking about the social norms, the customs, the rules that govern the proper mode of social interaction. Most of what I'll talk to, the data I'll talk about today come from Lomas Barbudal, my study site in Costa Rica, which is uh, just finishing its 19th continuous year. And I will also be talking about data collected at other sites because part of my talk today will be comparing uh, communicative rituals at different sites. So Santa Rosa, Lomas Barbudal, Palo Verde, and Curu, which are all in Guanacaste, Costa Rica. This is all tropical dry forest. As recently as about 60 years ago, these forests were all connected by corridors. So genetically, they're not that different probably. And ecologically, they're extremely similar as well. So this traditions project, most, and most of the work I'll talk about today is in a current anthropology article. Most of this comes from about 40,000 hours of observation uh, from several groups, uh, five groups at Lomas Barbadal from the past 19 years, Santa Rosa, seven groups, 1986 plus a decade in the 90s, Palo Verde, one group, one year, and Kuru, one group for multiple years. And these are all my collaborators. So how did we operationalize a social convention? It's a little bit tricky to do. Maybe not as quite as easy as a, as a tool use trait to, to identify. So we decided that we would call it a tradition or a social convention if the behavior was clearly present, that is seen at a rate of at least once per 100 hours in some groups, and clearly absent in others that had been followed for several hundred hours. The behavior also had to exhibit expansion in the number of performers over time, and the behavior had to be durable. Now this criterion is very ar arbitrary, I think not as important as, as the others. Here's an example of a social convention. This is hand sniffing. Notice how she has her friend's finger in her nostril. She's sticking it up there. Remember, they have long nails, claw-like nails, usually pretty dirty. They've just been in a kawadi carcass or something. And uh, they, this can't be very comfortable. You'll notice she's going to grimace a little bit there. As it wiggles around in the nose, it's, it's, it's a little bit delicate. And they love doing this. So sometimes they'll sneeze, and it'll blow out, and they'll stick it right back in. They'll, they'll do this for you know, at least 10 minutes, usually, and sometimes up to half an hour. And this is really striking for those of you who see capuchins in their daily lives. They're usually running around like maniacs, just hyperactive, can't sit still. And so this really stands out as something weird and very important to them, That's this deviant, deviance from their normal routine. So now I'm going to show you a table summarizing the results from all the different conventions we pulled out of this cross-site study. So these are the different traditions we identified. These are the study sites separated by boldface lines and the different study groups within each study site. So for example, hand sniffing, which I just described. OK, the C's mean common. It is a tradition at a site. An R means it's very rarely seen, just a couple of times. Hasn't been, um, it hasn't become a, a tradition at all. No one's picked up on it. The X's mean that we've studied this group for at least 300 hours, more often several thousand hours, and it hasn't ever been seen. And the question marks mean that it's never been seen, but perhaps we just didn't study it quite long enough. So you'll notice with hand sniffing, each of the groups, so the sites where we have multiple uh, groups, it was seen in some groups and not others. So it seems to have been invented multiple times. I should also say that the temporal patterning of these, this tradition and all these others is quite striking. So for example, hand sniffing in Abby's group was all the rage for female-female dyads between 1991, which when it first appeared, up through 97. And we've been studying this group intensively ever since and have not seen it since then. Uh, this group, it started as being a very common male-male activity and then vanished for 10 years and then was reinvented by a female who didn't know the original hand sniffers and spread through the group again. So the form may be slightly different in different groups. It could be the 
up the nose variety versus the, the gas mask kind of variety. So there are subtle uh, differences in, in the form of these traditions, but pretty similar. Uh, sucking of body parts, this is uh, where they will take a tail tip, a finger, maybe an ear, and they'll suck on it mutually for about an hour. And again, it stands out as very different from their normal manic behavior. Uh, this looks like it's been invented more times than it has been. It's really three independent inventions because all of these CSNRs are one male-male coalition migrating from group to group. These games, I'll explain what they are in a minute, but for now just notice that there are three inventions. Uh, one individual, Guapo, invented all of these games at, at Abby's group. Napoleon invented these two, and this is a third site. So there has been no contact between these monkeys and these monkeys. And then eyeball poking has only been invented once. <laughs> uh, and it was slow to spread. So <laughs> let me explain a little about these games. They all have a very similar format. This is all about turn taking. So Guapo here on the left, he was the innovator. In this a picture, and I'm sorry I don't have a video of this one because uh, it's funny. He, he will bite down on the finger of his partner, like, like that, and really hard, but just the right level so he doesn't bite off the finger, which they can do, <laughs> and or it doesn't even bleed, but hard enough that it's, it takes several minutes for the other monkey to use the hands and his other hand and his feet and mouth to pry open the m mouth and get the finger back. And then as soon as he's extricated his finger, he wants to do it again. So <laughs> he'll either put the finger back in or else they'll switch roles more commonly. And so he'll bite Guapo's finger. And so they'll go back and forth for maybe a half hour doing this. My favorite game, I think, is the hair biting game, where they'll bite a huge tuft of hair out of the face or shoulder all the way out. And you, you may be able to see in this um, the hair. He's trying to get it back. And it stretches a little. So every time they get some, gets it back, some gets lost. And then he has to get it back from him. And it goes back and forth until they run out of hair. And then they bite more hair out. And uh, so it'll go on for 10 to 30 minutes. And then there's the toy game, which is a little less interesting because it doesn't use part of a monkey. It's just a stick or a stone or some inanimate or in, um, inedible object. Now, for all of these games at Lomas, anyway, we were able to construct social transmission chains so we could see the number of links in a chain. So they're all pretty similar. I'll just show you one. Here is Guapo. These lines show the direction of transmission and the year of transmission. Dotted lines just mean that they did play it together, but he learned it from him first before he started playing with him. So you can see here that there are three links in a transmission chain which is pretty typical. And uh, it was invented by Guapo in 92, and it kept going up through 2001. And these four monkeys fissioned off and co-migrated and still played this game after leaving the group. Here's eyeball poking. So uh, she has got her friend's finger, and that long nail is going in the eye socket. You can see the lid being pulled down. In other clips, you can see the finger warming its way into the temple, which I don't think we'd be able to do. And it goes up to the first knuckle. And often, now she's being pretty cool about it, but often they, they blink like someone who's putting a contact lens in for the first time. And uh, so this is a little harder to get going. Rumor was the inventor. and. Initially, her partners would poke themselves in the eye and put their other finger in her eye, but they didn't want to have Rumor's finger in their eye until they'd had a lot, several months of practice at this. So either the poker or the pokey can initiate, and this is very risky for an arboreal primate to put someone's claw, basically, in their eye. As if they move quickly, you could just lose it. So all of these social conventions have some features in common. Risk and discomfort are and then it features of all of these, these conventions. And they're all practiced by dyads that have pretty relaxed social relationships. And they're not in the hubbub center hubbub of the group. They're off on the side a little bit. So they can really focus on what they're doing. And like I've said before, the, this focus is extremely noteworthy for a capuchin monkey. So everyone wants to know why they do these things. And of course, I can't know for sure. But uh, my best guess is that it has something to do with testing the quality of a social bond. So uh, one of my favorite papers in biology is by Zahavi, not his handicap paper, but the testing of a bond from 1975. So he proposes that 
animals can use a stress, impose a stressful stimulus, stimulus on, on another individual to see what kind of response that elicits, and that will inform them about the quality of their relationship. And so one of the examples he uses in his original paper is tongue kissing. It has to be a behavior that can be perceived as either intensely pleasurable or just horrifyingly disgusting, <laughs> depending on the nature of the relationship you have with this interaction partner. So the idea then is that the information is not in the stimulus itself, it's in the response you get. And so by what response do you get, you can gauge where you stand with this individual, whether you might be able to count on them in the future, in the near future for, for help. Randall Collins from sociology, microsociology, also talks a lot about interaction rituals, and he's mainly talking about human conversations. He doesn't really know that other animals do these things, I'm sure. Um, so he argues that in human conversations, you're, you're getting information about the level of commitment to this relationship as compared to other dyadic relationships in the community. By displaying the amount of enthusiasm, engagement, and coordination between partners. So it's not the text of what you say in the conversation. You can be talking about the weather, or you can be uttering sheer nonsense, or telling lies. That doesn't matter as much as all of these nonverbal kinds of aspects of the interaction. So um, another question I'm often asked is why, uh, why don't we see all this crazy stuff in other animals? And I, I don't know for sure. I mean, part of it may be that no one specifically goes out and looks for them. I'm an anthropologist and I'm interested in culture, so I looked hard to find this stuff and I badgered all of my colleagues at other sites to do the same. Um, another is that it's methodologically difficult to detect. Even if people have no, uh, see weird stuff, they don't necessarily write down things that aren't in their ethogram because it's not relevant to their question. So there could be a lot of similar things out there that just haven't been written up in this way or analyzed in this way. Another possibility is that it really is true that capuchins are pretty special, but the reasons why I think they need these more than other organisms are that they do have an incredibly complicated social life. Coalitions are key to just about every measure of success in a capuchin's life. But they're certainly not the only animals in the animal kingdom like that. So I think bottlenose dolphins, for example, should be doing these things. And I'll be interested to hear what Peter and, and Hal have to say about their cetaceans. And I asked Rich Connor about this a lot. He thinks they might, but he hasn't got back to me with a definitive answer yet. Uh, really quick, oh, well, I guess I won't talk about foraging. I'll do that tomorrow. But they do conform in a seven-year study. They do conform very much not only to their mother's style, but to the uh, techniques, foraging techniques of non-mothers as well. Thank you to my field assistants. Uh, there are a lot more than that. I think about 100 people have come through my site. Uh, my funding agencies and various people who help with the database. And if you want to know more about these amazing animals, that's the layperson's version. Thank you.